Hi, I'm Andy Weinberg with Miller Welders. Today we're at Pro Fabrication talking about stainless steel. I am uh, Steve Sousley, owner of Pro Fabrication, builders of world-class exhaust systems in Inconel, titanium, and stainless. Why stainless steel? Stainless is the most economical material for the type of exhaust systems that we build. We do want to build a durable, high-quality exhaust system here. What kind of properties in stainless make it ideal for your applications? I know you work in some racing and hot rod stuff, but what does the stainless steel do for you? Well, it uh, really prevents oxidation. Oxidation is the breakdown of iron and or uh, steel. Uh, in stainless steel, it prevents that uh, and gives you a longer lasting product. So it holds up better to higher temperatures? it holds up better to higher temperatures and the high heat, high vibration harmonics in the engine compartment, this material is ideal. If this were in a, used in a just a regular mild steel application, the high heat temperatures and the heat cycles that you see in those applications would cause those headers to basically corrode and fall apart much faster. Much fa faster. You may get uh, a reasonable life out of a mild steel system, but over time, if you're going to be in racing for an extended period of time, or if you're running durability races, such as 24-hour races or 500-mile events, stainless steel is the only material you that you should really use. Do you use or do you make products for other industries as well? Absolutely. We do stuff in street rods and we do stuff in uh, motorcycle racing. Uh, but primarily it's a lot of racing, but we, the, the street rod business is a, is a part of our business, absolutely. So there's not so much performance, it just might be more aesthetically pleasing or pretty. Aesthetically pleasing and pretty, uh, and something that's going to last for the life of the vehicle mm -hmm. at that point. Exactly. In a race car exhaust system, it does have a, uh, a mileage limit or a, a duty cycle, where in a street rod application, it will last the entire uh, life of the vehicle. So I see some of the products you're using here are the Dynasties and the Maxstars. Uh, the inverter engine that the Dynasty and Maxstar uses allows you to have a real fine, well-defined arc as opposed to some of the older standard transformer technology machines. So this would give you that control you're looking for. It does. The process that we primarily use here is TIG welding. So in addition to just the inverter technology, uh, we're using our foot to control uh, the arc and the heat in, the, in that weld puddle. So the operator does have total control over the heat that he's applying to the, to the correct, material. Correct, correct, absolutely. Okay. And in addition to the stainless being a real temperature sensitive material, other challenges you see in welding it are? Well, it comes back to basics at that point. Uh, really uh, good fits, clean material, uh, proper tungsten preparation, uh, proper gas coverage, back gassing, purging, etc. Those are the primary factors in achieving a good weld. Why is gas so important with stainless steel? What, what happens if, if you don't have it proper? Well, if you don't have the proper gassing, uh, whether if that's uh, called the back gassing, uh, if you don't uh, purge or back gas your welds, uh, you're going to have what is referred to as sugaring or premature oxidation of the material. And that is when the weld puddle is exposed to oxygen or ambient air. So that causes that portion of the weld puddle to be very brittle and really basically you lose the, the parent metal strength or the base material. You lose, you lose the integrity of the, of the material and it will, it will ultimately fail in this application. In other applications, uh, such as the food industry, et cetera, et cetera, you may have food particles that will get trapped into those tiny little crevices and ruin batches of whatever that may be, product. Because of the bacteria that would form. Absolutely, okay. yes. Uh, so, in other words, if, if back gassing is that important, even tack welding is important to back gas, is that correct? It is. Uh, once you've uh, created that oxidation inside the tube, you can never really get rid of it. Uh, yes, you can turn your heat up and you can try to melt it away and so forth and so on, but you're never going to get that uh, completely gone in the granular structure of the material. Okay. So what are some of the methods you use to shield or uh, keep the weld area clean? We completely uh, flow the argon through the tube and we do that by uh, backing up the one side of the uh, or blocking off one side of the tube 
and then uh, running a hose and a regulator off of our argon supply source, we use a small amount of gas to go through that tube and flow through that tube. When you, the, the proper amount of flow through that tube is where you can just feel it on your skin or on your lips as you're, uh, a, 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 as you're working with that. Too much pressure on your backside will cause the weld puddle to almost bubble up at you. You don't want too much flow. That's right. Just enough to keep the backside shielded when it becomes molten. That's right. If you totally block it off, you will create pressure inside of that tube. Or if the hole is too small and your gas uh, pressure is too high or your flow rate's too high, it will actually blow the weld out. Uh, so you really want to use the largest uh, diameter gas lens uh, ceramic uh, cup that you can. Uh, for the application. Uh, there are going to be tight uh, spaces that you need to get into and maybe will limit you to the size of cup that you can use. Uh, but primarily the largest cup, the largest uh, gas lens that you can use. Some of the things that we want to talk about here are the effects of a gas lens. They have a screen around them and the screen diffuses the gas stream coming out so it makes it a bigger and wider and a more gentle uh, gas flow over your workpiece. So these are all important factors in coming out with a great weld. So what are the most common base metal alloys and filler metals that you choose to use? Uh, we primarily use 321 alloy material here, but we, in addition to that we also use 304. Uh, as far as the uh, filler metal, uh, we use primarily 347 welding rod. What thicknesses are common? 035, 045, and 065. Wow. Those are the most common. Uh, as we get into thinner and thinner materials, such as if you're welding 035 thick uh, tubing or 20 gauge tubing, we're probably going to use 035 or thinner as a filler rod. A good rule of thumb in that application is your filler metal really shouldn't be thicker than the base metal that you're welding. That is correct. Uh, and one of the reasons that you can do that is if you have good proper fits, uh, you will not need a lot of filler metal. And your temperatures could be proper, you're not overheating the tubing. Uh, this is a temperature sensitive base metal anyway, so that's very critical. That's, that's, that's correct. Thanks Steve for spending some time talking about some basic stainless steel welding tips. In our next segment, we're going to be talking about some advanced techniques including the pulser and welding in tight spaces. And for more racing, customizing, restoring tips, go to MillerWelds.com.